We already started. Well, as Eddie told you, and thank you for that nice introduction, we're so happy to be here. We're really excited to talk to fellow California Native plant members who've contributed so much to us over the years while we've been photographing. Uh, I, with this, this project, this book, our wildflower journey started out uh, 27 years ago. I was in a lab in San Francisco processing oh, some of my landscape film and um, I met a fellow photographer there, a fellow nature photographer there, and she said, hey, the Antelope Valley California Poppy Reserve is going crazy this year. They had six bad years and this is a particularly good year. I'd imagine you'd, you'd want to go back there. I said, yeah, uh, well, no, back there. I've never been there before. And she said, really, you're a landscape, you're a nature photographer in California and you haven't been to the Poppy Reserve? I said, I, you know, I said kind of sheepishly, no. She said, well, we have to go down. This isn't going to last very long. So another photographer and my friend Liz, who I had been talking to, and I went down in probably April of 1992. And when we got there, we saw this amazing, and I mean amazing bloom. And I, I hadn't been much of a wildflower photographer, so this was all new to me. When I saw this, I was just breathtaking. I couldn't believe there were so many beautiful flowers. So what made this bloom so unusual was the fact that there were these beautiful uh, bird's eye gilia, these purple flowers scattered in with the California poppies. Normally the whole area would have been just poppies, but because of whatever the weather conditions were, uh, this was a really uh, amazing bloom. So I called Nita that evening. I said, you really, really have to come down. You have to see this. Uh, this is a maybe a once in a lifetime thing. So um, I photographed for a couple, for I think the next day. Then I drove back home to San Francisco, which is probably like a seven hour drive in gutter. And we came back down and we photographed for two more days. And this is what started our whole wildflower journey. Prior to that, when Rob and I met in a photo lab, um, I was waiting for my prints to arrive <clears throat> excuse me, for a competition I was involved in uh, the next day, and this print showed up. So um, that's when our relationship started over 33 years ago. And at the time, I was a people photographer and doing a lot of work around diversity. And um, this was an image from the Children of the Tenderloin project that I had been working on. And Rob was primarily a nature photographer. So we had our separate careers and we supported each other's work. Over the years, six couples counselors later, um, we were still together and we decided to start uh, combining our efforts and start documenting wildflowers in California. And not only California, we were doing it throughout the West. So this project started as a project throughout the West. We had both grown up in New England and New England didn't have flowers like California at all. And um, that's, we were hooked. So uh, this is the earliest image that is in the book. This was taken in 1986. I had been wanting to find a beautiful picture of uh, the California Buckeye and I was searching around in the hills east of Carmel uh, right around <clears throat> right around sunset I saw this beautiful tree and noticed that there were the beautiful kind of purple flowers I didn't know what they were at the time um, so people ask well what's the actual time span of images in the book so this was the first image taken in 1986 Actually, probably 85 even. Yeah, before probably we 85, met. sure. Before we met. So uh, at, at that time, like Nita said, when she met me, I had been a nature photographer. I had been photographing for about 20 years. And after doing that for 20 years, I decided I would love to do something with my talent, with my skill, uh, with uh, just to do more than just create 
pretty pictures. I wanted to help create um, more energy toward land conservation and uh, saving species. So I was fortunate to be hired by the Trust for Public Land for whom I did about 30 projects. This is a project image. Uh, this land was originally privately held ranch land in, in the Sierra Nevada foothills that through the efforts of the Trust for Public Land was eventually uh, conveyed into uh, Sequoia National Park. At that time, I had also been photographing environmental issues such as mining on public land. I gave a slideshow at the National Press Club in Washington, D.C. in 1998 when the Clinton administration was trying to get through mining law reform. So I I started doing some aerial work to get uh, gra you know to give a good perspective of what was happening on our public lands, and then I also worked on on water issues, and this was an image of an unregulated rural dump on Native American land. Well, after doing a lot of environmental work showing a lot of the destruction on both private and public lands, I was getting really burned out seeing all these things. So I decided um, there was time for a change. I really wanted to do more to help promote land conservation. And at that time, climate change was not an issue so much in the public awareness. And I was, um, when I first came to California, I became a firefighter for CDF up in Leggett, Northern California. And I always had a, um, a camera on my belt. And this was a a um, pile of truck tires that started burning. So that's why the smoke is so black. And um, then I got involved in doing photography in the Tenderloin. I was asked to do a project on the children of the Tenderloin. And the image in the, on the right was one of the images from two year project um, on the Tenderloin. And it really launched my career to, um, photographing children and families and celebrating diversity, human diversity. I did the uh, calendars, a number of calendars for the Children's Defense Fund and worked with a really talented uh, artist, Taya Schrack, to do the hand coloring for me. And then I got involved in creating public art projects, such as the one on the right, which is the Faces of the Canal. Rob and I live in Marin City and the first FACES project we did was to celebrate the diversity in Marin City. And these were seven foot banners that hung throughout the streets. So I had some health issues. I stopped doing the people photography and started to join Rob out in the field more. And we started focusing more and more on the wildflowers. So uh, Nina and I carried a whole lot of equipment up to uh, around Winnemucca Lake, which is at the top of Carson Pass. Uh, we had heard that that area had a particularly great amount of diversity because there were uh, different ecoregions or different habitats that uh, coincided there. So I was carrying 85 pounds of camera equipment and cam camping gear and Nita was carrying 65 pounds we spent uh and i'll never do that again yeah, <laughs> and we and we spent about four or five days up there um and it was the first time that i really spent a lot of time using a digital camera i had been doing film camera photography for years and years and finally converted to digital converted to digital photography which offered a lot of things such as not having to carry film and um, also being able to see what we were getting in the camera and knowing whether we had what we wanted and not having to wait till we got back to the labs or having to pay for all that film and processing. And it was also environmentally friendlier to not be doing all that film and processing. And in order to be able to pay for the work that we were doing, we fortunately connected with some ar architects and art consultants and began selling our work to um, help create greater environments and more healing environments in medical facilities. So this image is a, a collection of California poppies. It's part of a contact 
series in a way that I photo a different way that I photograph flowers that I'll tell you uh, about later. But uh, these were 20 foot uh, wide, eight foot high panels that were lobby dividers in the Kaiser Redwood City Hospital. So we tried to use as many, uh, we tried to convince our art consultant to use as many native wildflowers in the project as, as we could. And each floor was a different color. So it was a fun challenge to find the right, um, the right plants. We also worked with, um, in creating other healthcare art. When the flowers weren't out, we loved to go out and photograph birds. This is the Merced National Wildlife Refuge. And to just create art with another part of, of nature. This is Woodbridge near Sacramento. So uh, one of the most frequent questions we get asked is what was your most amazing wildflower bloom you've ever seen in photographing these flowers for 27 years? So we tell them uh, that in 2003, uh, above the town of Gorman, which is near uh, Tahone Pass going over the grapevine, there was a wildflower bloom that was about a thousand feet high from where the freeway went through Peace Valley, Interstate 5, from the bottom of that canyon all the way to the top. It was a thousand feet high and about a mile wide. It was just all flowers. And the biggest challenge, because it was so beautiful, was to uh, settle on a, on a, on a composition because everything was just beautiful. Everything was, was, was just mind boggling. And this is a detail to give you a sense of the type of flowers that were making up these swatches of color. And we were able to get onto the other side of the freeway. Um, there was public land on the other side. And so we had this wonderful vantage point across the freeway and um, could just see the whole hillside. So this on, our, on the bottom left is um, Hungry Valley State Vehicular Recreation Area. And on the other side is private land, which we're certainly hoping that someday will be protected. And Highway 5 goes between these two hills. So this was an image uh, that was part of that series and uh, Nita convinced me to submit it to the, to the BBC and uh, British Museum of Natural History competition, a wildlife photographer of the year. They had a category for uh, uh, wild places and I, I took uh, put the equivalent of second place and we went to London to get the award. I wanted to bring a bunch of images down, so we hurriedly threw together an on-demand copy of a book just filled with wildflowers, and that was what started the whole idea of actually put uh, collecting our images and putting it in, in them into some cohesive form, format in a coffee table book. We just lucked out with the weather on, on this particular trip. We even had some snowflakes during this trip. It was a clearing storm, and so the uh, dark gray clouds had these little openings of, of sunlight that moved across the hillsides, and it was really challenging to photograph because things were happening so quickly. And again, that was in the days of films. The other mo uh, most beautiful experience we've had photographing flowers was in the Carrizo Plain in 2017. Anita can tell you about that. So this is the Tembler Mountains and this is what we consider, um, you'll see why we consider this our second favorite over 27 years. And we drove in over the Tembler Mountains um, to get into the monument. This scene was on the other side in the Caliente Mountains. And we had just seen a few desert candles in the time we had ever been in the desert. <clears throat> and someone told us to go check out the Caliente Mountains. 
and we came around the corner and we were just blown away by what we saw. I mean, this is continuing to the right of us, it's continuing to the left of us. There were tens of thousands of desert candles, which are actually in the mustard family. So this is the Carrizo Plain. You are looking east and Bakersfield would be over those hills and that's the Temblor Range. Uh, behind us, uh, we are in the Caliente Range and San Luis Obispo would be to our west. So that kind of orients you north and south and east and west. And you've heard a lot about Carrizo Plains and the Trump administration opening it up for drilling. And what that's actually not in the um, flat part here. It's actually behind us on the other side of the mountains and to the south in the Koyama Valley. But it still shouldn't be happening. And this is a detail of some of what you're seeing in that yellow area down below. And this image Nita took with her iPhone over the course of photographing um, we used, we figured out that we used about 10 different cameras from a film camera that you see, uh, well, you'll see later to a whole variety of digital cameras. So uh, we have a section in the book called Behind the Scenes because people like to know how we did our photographs. Uh, because our, um, our uh, botanical images, the close-up looked like they were done in a studio, we like to explain how they're done. Every photograph of a, of a flower is done out in the field with natural light, with the flowers safe and sound in the ground. And if we can't get to a, a, a flower, a good specimen, without doing some damage, we won't do it. So, I, so there are three types of, of uh, close-up photography. If the image in the upper left-hand corner, uh, we put a, bl a solid black background, a uh, fabric behind the flower. Uh, the or, next, a or a piece of plexiglass, black or white. Right. Now the next image down, uh, you may be able to see there's, a, there's Chinese houses with some texture. Well, there's a fabric in the background that I, um, I use to make some uh, complementary folds to enhance the whole composition. I get tired of just these solid black or white backgrounds all the time and I wanted to do something different. So if you look on the right hand side you see that image of alpine daisies is wrapped in white. Um, so that's the second type of uh, close-up photography we and that, do. And that's called the wrap series obviously because it's wrapped in fabric. You want to tell them what kind of fabric you yeah, I went through five different types of fabric before I finally found this beautiful, uh, delicate chiffon that had some nice curves when I uh, rearranged the fabric. Uh, so we carry all that equipment with us when we go photograph. Those, the top two images were always, almost always done on a tripod and I got, you know, kind of tired of doing that so I came up with a way to take the camera off the tripod and uh, get the flower in contact with with the lens of the camera. So the lens of the camera then is blocking the light falling on the flower itself. So the light from the background then is transmitted through the flower petals and gives you this nice translucent a uh, gentle kind of ethereal effect for the flower. And that's a more spontaneous thing. Uh, it takes a lot of images because the flower is moving around. I'm very careful not to hurt the flower, but the flower moves around as I touch it. So it takes quite a few tries to get something really, really good. And I also want to let you know, we both photograph I was a people photographer, didn't work with a tripod mostly, so when I would photograph, I often didn't use a tripod, which sometimes drove Rob crazy. Um, <clears throat> but he, he, he is a, a Capricorn and has the patience and um, willingness to have the aching back. So often, even if I would find the flowers, um, he would um, set it up 
and we would work together to come up with the final composition and and uh, often I would become the assistant holding reflectors or backgrounds and we actually got pretty good at finding ways to have it all um, clip to things so we had to hold on to as little as possible. So um, the average it takes for us, well for me, to do a close-up is probably about 20 to 40 minutes. The longest it took was this desert lily. Um, Oops, going the wrong way, sorry. Uh, this was when I was doing film. Nita had found this flower uh, late the previous evening. We decided to come back early in the morning to get the light on the flower. Uh, so when I was, I, you know, long story short, it took me two and a half hours with seven Polaroids. You can see me holding a, a Polaroid in the back. The light was coming uh, from the left-hand side, uh, so that side of the flower was well illuminated, but the opposite side was in the shade, so we had to bounce light in to, the, to that side, and then we had to fill the front of it in with this cloth here, and then the wind was blowing, so we had to, you know, block the wind. This was just a really frustrating experience, but I just love this, love this lily. Well, I just want to point out, too, on the pile of clothes on the left aren't there just by chance. They actually were piled there to block the sun from hitting the sand and the leaves below, so that we ended up with that. And what made this, this flower so unusual was that normally this desert lily probably stands, you know, two, two and a half feet tall. Well, you, you might have recalled the uh, height of this one. There was so much water, there was so much rain that this plant was putting, you know, most of its energy into flowers and, and into buds. So you can see all, all, all the buds on this. I mean, this was an atypical uh, uh, version of that flower. So we'll just show you some of the setups. And we like to create the setup so we could show people where the plants live as well as the techniques we used. How are we doing on time? We're fine. We're doing fine. Okay. People are loving it. Oh, good, good. <laughs> Thank you. Lots of, lots of nice comments and a few questions for whenever you're uh, ready to take them. Sure. Okay. So again, we do our best to uh, make sure that we don't, we don't harm the plants at all. Um, some of the tripod setups are really, really awkward and you know, you can see what it was that goes into it. But you know, taking all that time and being all that patient uh, gives us what it is we really want to show the beauty of these individual living beings. And a lot of the work we have done is, is in uh, Marin County because we live here and it also with Mount Tam and with Point Reyes and all the different ecosystems that Marin County has. It's just the perfect place to photograph and find wildflowers. And um, I don't know if we mentioned this before, but almost everything we've done has been on public land. And that was a conscious choice. We could have photographed our flowers in botanical gardens and things like that to get the individual species, but it was important for us to actually photograph out where these flowers live and photograph on the public lands to show people, you know, what we have inherited and we need to protect on our nation's public lands. And we were just up at Ring Mountain, which is one of our favorite places, and there were a lot of farewell to spring on the um, west side of the preserve. So this was a Calypso orchid I photographed on Mount Tamalpais, and this was again back when I was using film, and sometimes to get down right at the you know, eye level with the flower, just, you know, you just get into these really strange, um, you know, postures. Now with digital photography, with the view screen on the back that I can tilt up, I don't have to be lying on the ground to look at the angle that's at ground level.
And Rob mentioned that he was carrying 85 pounds when we went up to Carson Pass, while he normally would carry 65 pounds. And I would carry probably about 25. So Nita had found this flower. This is at the bottom of Ring Mountain in Corte Madero. She had found it the day before and um, we had to get back home. So I didn't have time to uh, photograph it then. I came out the next day. It was, a, it was in the springtime toward the end of the storms. It was gray overcast. The sky looked kind of threatening. I uh, made the uh, <coughs> comp I made the composition and I packed up and three minutes later, it just started raining like crazy. So, you know, even though flowers bloom in the spring, there's, you know, there's still the chance of rain. But what's nice about when there's a cloudy sky or a foggy sky is the enveloping light is really, really soft. Sometimes we photograph the flowers against the backgrounds with the flower in the sunlight. And sometimes we photograph the flower with diffuse light, and we'll talk more about that later. So this was a beautiful checkered bloom. Yeah, and I missed this opportunity because I was in traffic school because I had gotten a ticket. So he was on his own on that one. And then we try to take a flower and photograph it differently than it's been seen before or than we've photographed it before, and we end up with something like this. This is a beautiful paintbrush. And then you start to see the wonderful details and the stickiness and the hairs when you really get in close. One of our favorite trails on Mount Tam is the old stage road that takes you up to the West Point Inn. And this is the Western Azalea. And one of the things we really love about it is it's really fragrant besides being beautiful. So if you ever find them, uh, make sure you take a sniff. You don't even have to get that close to, they're very, very perfumey. So we can, this is all the way up by Quincy. So the whole variety of irises in the state. And we, as we've said before, we work with natural light. We don't work with strobes. And we found that it gives us more variety. And again, another wrapped version with a thicker fabric. With a chiffon, if you have the slightest breeze, it will, uh, it will blow away. So it, that can be really challenging. That's why we had all these, all these rocks on this, on on this fabric, we hiked up to Morgan Pass on the east side of the Sierra uh, above the Mosquito. Mosquito Lake. Yeah, yeah. and uh, found this beautiful alpine daisy. So for me, it's always like a treasure hunt to see what I can find. This was on the way back down from Morgan Pass. It was, you know, we always cut it pretty close. Often we get back to the camp in dark and eat, you know, eat, eat like cheese and crackers before we go to bed. You know, we, there's always we another... Cook. We yeah. never cook. We never have time to cook. There's always another flower to photograph. This is on Ring Mountain. So one of our favorite spots in Marin County. And so this is a, a, a contact series flower, and this was done out in Point Reyes. So again, the uh, flower is gently touching the front of the lens. The lens is blocking the light falling on the flower. So the light from behind the flower is being transmitted through the flower's petals, and it gives this really, really nice soft effect. And I always make sure that there is something, um, why don't you show the next one? I always make sure there is something in the photograph that is sharp to give you a sense of clarity for the whole thing. But I love the soft, the softness of this technique. As far as I know, I'm, I'm the only one who is doing this. There may be someone else, but I'm, but I'm not aware of that. And as Rob mentioned before, Sometimes we'll photograph a flower with direct sunlight on it. 
And then other times we'll use a diffuser. Again, this is Ring Mountain again, later in the season. And you soften the light. So I can show you again, this is softer light. This is with sunlight. It's got a very different feel to it. And one's not better than the other. It really depends on what works for that particular flower. So I mentioned earlier that it takes us from 20 to 40 minutes and sometimes longer. So when we've got all these uh, options for lighting, you know, it's, it's, it will do things under multiple lighting situations, take them back home and then edit them and find out which one we, we really want to uh, select if it's for book publication or for printing. And people always say, well, you, you know, how much Photoshop work do you do well? Was it Photoshop? Yeah, was it Photoshop? Everything is Photoshop. We take uh, a raw capture. It's it's all the data that the camera sensor seals uh, sees. And in this instance, we were photographing in the shade, so the camera sensor uh, picks up the exact color of the light that is falling on the scene uh, in the shade the sky which is blue is the only source of illumination so it puts a blue cast on the whole scene and that's what the that's what the camera sensor sees the camera sensor also uh you uh, gives us a very very low contrast image so it's not what our perception was when we were in that location so this is what the camera sensor saw and and our eyes correct for this blue light. So when you see somebody in the shade, you don't see them as blue. You see them as neutral light. So when we work on the image, whoops, we want to get it back to what we experienced. So yeah, we Photoshop everything. <laughs> I mean, even just to process any type of uh, digital file, it needs to go into Photoshop. But we're always trying to, almost always trying to get it back to what we experienced. And sometimes um, the background, we don't have a big enough background to get everything perfect to what we want. In this case, it was a big white sheet on a uh, clamp to a walking stick. It was a broom pole. Was it a broom pole? Yeah. And um, so we needed to take it into Photoshop and clean up the background as well as process the image and um, have it look like what our experience was. We yeah. actually got stopped by the ranger and um, because we didn't have a permit to photograph. So that's a whole issue that you might run into in on public land. Well, we had a tripod and that's, you know, supposedly if you have a tripod, you're no longer, anyway. Yeah, that's our rant. So this is what it looks like on a uh, on the two page spread in the book. Now this was a really interesting buckeye to photograph uh, on the east side of the Sierra. This was right by the side of the road, and uh, it was really, really, really windy. So we had rocks uh, holding all the fabric down. Uh, we had two pieces of fabric. There was all the all the dust and all, all the fine grains of sand being blown on there. Uh, also, again, the camera sensor uh, is is seeing all the light and seeing the color of the light, and it's a really really low contrast image that we're getting out of the camera. So, in the next image, this was what we saw. So we take it into Photoshop and we clean up the background and we bring back up the, the saturation and the color that we, that we experienced. And again, this is what it looks like in the two page spread. Now we deal with not only wind, um, but also heat, sometimes rain as Rob said, and in this case in Utah, we were dealing with the no and we were being attacked by insects. I'm actually wearing 
a clean pair of underwear under of my underpants over my head to keep the noceums out of my ears, as well as bandanas and trying to tie off everything we could. Unfortunately, Rob wasn't as successful at keeping them off him, and he had over 200 bites. After days of photographing, and they drove in me Capitol crazy. Capitol Reef area. Go to bed at night and you itch like crazy. So it's, it's not easy work, but we, we love doing it. So I wanted to talk a little bit about how I mentioned earlier that we had started the project um, photographing wildflowers throughout the West. And California was of particular interest because it was our local state and it was so diverse, but we were still going throughout the West. And we met Joan Jasper, who worked at the San Francisco Main Library up at the West Point Inn, and we told her about our project. And she said, we would love to have your exhibit at the Jewett Gallery, but we wanted to have a California focus and uh, with an emphasis on the Bay Area. And so that's when we created Beauty and the Beast, California Wildflowers and Climate Change, which eventually led to its companion coffee table book. So in the exhibit, we wanted to show what it took to get the images. We uh, have, you know, wildflower guides, we've had maps. Um, one of the things that made uh, photographing these close-ups on the ground uh, so bearable was we found a pair of knee pads uh, from the co from a company called Ergodyne who donated them and thank you thank you very very much. Uh, I, I I wore these knee pads and it was like kneeling in really firm jello, so I could be on my knees photographing a flower for twenty minutes at, at a time and not and forty five minutes <laughs> and not and not you know, hurt my knees either short term or long term. And the other organization we want to thank that helped uh, us was uh, um, Think Tank. I have a waste pouch uh, series of pouches on my belt that carried all my camera equipment so I could carry a backpack that had all our lighting equipment on. So Think Tank, uh, donated all the uh, all the individual pouches I used to carry all the camera equipment that I carried. So thank you, Think Tank. And Ergodyne is E R G O D Y N E. And even if you're not out to interest in photographing, they're great for gardening too. Um, and then another thing that I take when we go out is a pair of binoculars. I mean, I. Sometimes I use them for birds, but I actually use them for finding flowers um, because I can see a color on a hillside and I'll want to know what kind of flower it is. And, and uh, binoculars are really good for that. Nina's got these really incredible eyes. I, I mean, I think I see a lot, that, you know, I see everything I've been photographing for, you know, 40, 40 50 years, but she has the ability to discern subtle colors that you know sometimes I just don't. So she'll see something off in the distance and say, wow, look at there's a red flower over there. We should go check it out. And I'm where, where, where? So she'll walk me right up to it. Oh, okay. So I, you know, it's really a collaborative process to get these flowers, not only finding them, but helping with the lighting and, you know, I. I look at something, a composition, and I look at it, and I think it's done, and it's fine. She said, well, why don't you look at it this way? So, okay, so I'll change the tripod and go through the whole thing, and occasionally her composition is better than mine, so I'm grateful to have her. And also, I wanted to mention with this exhibit is that it is a traveling exhibit now. It's been seen by over 45,000 people. Um, actually, half, half of it, 52 images. and we just found out that it's going to the San Diego Natural History Museum. They're creating their own personal uh, or customized large print version. And we have a phone conversation with them next week and we'll find out. It was supposed to open in September. We're not sure exactly when it's gonna open, but it'll be there for almost a year. So keep your ears out for 
that, if, especially if you're down in the San Diego area, and we're really excited about that. Oops, wrong way. So when we wanted to put this book together, we wanted to celebrate the diversity, the biodiversity, but we also wanted to create a collection of voices, of diverse voices for the wildflowers, people who would become a voice for wildflowers to accompany our images. And we, Peter Raven, many of you may have heard of him. He's in the upper left corner, is, wrote our forward and the uh, short essay about uh, the origin of California's flowers. So we have 16 authors who wrote 18 short stories about their relationship to either public lands, the nature, flowers, and um, for Hawk. example, Jose Gonzalez is next to Peter. He wrote the uh, story about connecting to nature. So the authors tell the wildflowers story. Um, I wanted to have a book that was more than just a collection of beautiful wildflower images and wildflower landscapes. We we really wanted to give the wildflowers a uh, voice and uh, we changed the original name of the book, which was Impressions of Spring, a voice for wildflowers of the West on our public lands to the uh, title we have now, which is Beauty and the Beast, California Wildflowers and Climate Change because during the 27 years of photographing, I don't know, climate change became more and more of an issue. So we wanted to include that in the whole wildflower story. So we have a wonderful short story by Ryan Burnett from Point Blue Conservation, who uh, talks about we'll the oh, mm -hmm. talks about the epic migration of the uh, Rufus hummingbird. We'll talk about that. Um, so it's a very collaborative project. Uh, we worked with about a dozen organizations and universities to help us um, put the, the written material together for this book. And the California Native Plant Society, with whom you may know we co-published, uh, helped us with a, with a grant to help with paying for the publication of the book. So the book... Uh, was divided into three separate sections. We wanted to have some continuity uh, with the flowers and the essay and the short stories. And so our book designer, Laura Lovett, who is a CNPS member in the Marin chapter, designed our book and she decided that an appropriate way to uh, to, to divide the book was three separate sections, the uh, gift of beauty, the human connection, and ensuring the future. Which was, that section is about in, um, giving people ideas of how to take action, because we've, the book is all about inspiring hope and action. Yeah, our, our purpose, our intention, and our goal is, is to attract people to the beauty of the flowers and uh, get them to read the short stories to hopefully inspire some hope and action with respect to, you know, climate change, land conservation, and species extinction. And we're getting wonderful feedback from people. And this was the essay that Rob was mentioning uh, by Ryan Burnett, who's a Point Blue science um, uh, botanist who's, or scientist who's working in the Sierra Mountains, um, studying uh, the the migration of the Rufus hummingbird, and they migrate from uh, Mexico all the way through California up to Alaska, and their um, this this story is about the whole issue of phenology and timing. It's called chasing spring and making sure that there are flowers for these birds um, during their migration. And, oops, would you like to turn that off, please? Um, and one of the problems is that um, with climate change, that's changing and is, is interrupting um, their ability to have food throughout, the, throughout their migration. And so uh, this, this image, excuse me, this image of the hummingbird was 
probably the most for fortunate serendipitous image in all the 27 years of photographing the flowers. We were, we had set the whole setup up just to get this beautiful uh, scarlet fritillary and um which was what about three four feet off the ground yeah it was about three feet off the ground there was a slight breeze so i had to have a really fast shutter speed to stop the movement of the flower and um, i happened to have the right exposure the right shutter speed the right framing i was looking through the viewfinder i had my my finger on the remote release and this bird flew in i got two frames and the bird was gone and i showed me and i said god look at this i mean you we couldn't plan for this so hopefully maybe to, to get it again we waited there for another 20 minutes and hoped the bird would show up and it didn't so um this is like i said this is the luckiest photograph i've had in 27 years i'm so grateful for this little bird that flew in and made the photograph for me thank you so just um, quickly, these are some of the uh, um, items that are in the book. This is the National Wildlife Federation's um, story about pollinators and how diverse they are and how important they are. One of, what? Can I add something? Absolutely. Thank you. Um, I, this is another instance where we were photographing uh, elk someplace and came across this this beautiful flower and there was a beautiful butterfly on it the butterfly wasn't distracted by me putting up the black background there uh it just just you know it was just it another yeah it was just another fortunate experience with something living and moving and then we have um, the desert is one of our favorite places to photograph. So we asked Susan Twite, who's a nature writer, to write a story about the five deserts. Most people don't know there are five deserts in California, and 25% of the land mass in California is considered desert. So it's our favorite place to photograph because there's so much biodiversity there. Um, you can see the geology. Robin Wall Kimmerer, many of you may know of her through the, her book, Sweetgrass, Braiding mm -hmm. Sweetgrass, um, wrote this wonderful story about taking her students out um, into the field and about the naming of wildflowers from uh, Linnaeus, who created the um, scientific taxonomy to her grandmother's names for the wild strawberry. And now what's happening with DNA renaming again. And Wendy Takuda wrote a wonderful story, very funny story about Zen and the art of pulling broom and how she just loves um, the work out in the field, transforming uh, um, in areas that have been badly invaded by invasive species back to the natural habitats. So a lot of it is on volunteering and the, and the joys of volunteering. And then also talking to children about climate change without scaring them by Amber Paris. And um, this is a candy flower that Rob photographed at Point Reyes and we thought it was appropriate to put it in this section. Yeah, uh, I hadn't, we hadn't come across that flower. I came across it late when we were putting everything in the book and I said this thing just had to go when there's such an unusual iridescent flower. So, so there's crazy. seed saving uh, with Genevieve Arnold from the Theater Payne Foundation and then we have a section in the book on um, wildfires and the flower recoveries that happen after wildfires. Actually um, Eddie should we do some questions now or do you want to wait to the end? Well, there's a lot of them built up. Some of them are technical and others, there's, there's many comments with the words beautiful and awesome and wonderful in them too. And we'll have, uh, we'll have all that for you to uh, review later. Okay. Um, there's sort of, uh, some of them are about, you know, your camera work, 
Like, uh, do you ever do focus stacking? We haven't learned that. No, no. we haven't um, taken the time to do it. Plus, it's a little bit of a challenge out in the field when plants are moving. Yeah, that's the main plant. reason. That's the main reason why we haven't done it. The, um, yeah, it's a it's a whole technical thing. I thought about it. I bought some focusing rails and I played with it a little bit. And it it's just, I've got a 42 megapixel Sony A7R3 camera that lets me back up a bit and get more in focus. I use a Canon uh, 50 millimeter macro lens that I've used forever. Um, I can get really good depth of field, so I don't need the focus stacking so much. Um, but it's, 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 it's really useful. I just found because of the wind, it just didn't work. And uh, so are you primarily using Canon for your digital work? I've got Canon. We, we started out with Canon a long, long time ago. And then when Sony came out with a good mirrorless camera, the first one I bought was about five years ago. I've gone through three different upgrades on that camera. So I've got an adapter uh, made by Metabones that I put on my Sony mirrorless camera. And I've used all the Canon lenses on it at some point when I've got enough money I'll probably convert to Sony lenses and not have to use the adapter but uh, right now Canon glass and S Sony camera okay and so and then more on the conservation uh, side of things what are the most drastic environmental and climate changes that you've seen over the years and what regions have you seen the most changes in uh, well the book isn't uh, so much about documenting but what have we seen? changes, but what we've seen, I think some of the worst things we've seen are the invasive grasses. I mean, you look at Marin County and you see, you know, how much of it is wild oats that was formerly native, you know, native grasslands that the Native Americans burned. Um, we went to Anza Borrego Desert State Park, uh, what is it, in 2005? And we were seeing how uh, a uh, invasive uh, mustard was coming in and taking over the habitat, how the invasive grasses were coming in. And then when the fires come in, uh, how the invasive grasses burn. So um, it's about what the invasives have done. Um, That's easier to see than the actual climate change because, um, weather affects flowers as well as climate change. So the difference in weather from one year to another can create a completely different bloom. And you can't say it's necessarily climate change, but what we do know, it's the people who are doing the research who have been able to tell us what's going on and the concerns, especially up in the mountains, is as it, the mountains get warmer, the plants and animals that can't handle the heat only have so far to go before they run out of soil or they run out of a habitat they can live in. So that's one of the areas where climate change is really affecting um, the, the, the mountain habitats. Yeah, we were photographing in Mount Rainier and we were talking to a ranger there and he was, he was saying that as climate change is happening, some of these meadows are drying out and I imagine it's not just restricted to the Cascades or the Sierra, it's probably globally, that as these uh, meadows dry out, um, that more of the native shrubs and more of the trees are invading these meadows because the roots um, of these shrubs and trees that normally couldn't tolerate a high moisture content in the soil uh, because of the lower moisture content in the soil, now the environment is more conducive for shrubs and trees. So these, so some of these beautiful meadows are going to be disappearing. Right. Oh, yeah. That we we wildly concur here. Here, even in the urban areas, our number one problems are the invasives, for sure. Yeah. But um, so can I just jump in here, Eddie, for a second? These sure. These images that I'm going through right now, um, Lake County and Southern California show what happens when the canopy opens up after a burn and the flowers are able to get a lot more sun and the 
um, ash becomes a fertilizer. So yeah. you can have amazing wildflower blooms after flowers, just like six months later. All these geophytes, all these, uh, all these bulb plants, like, like the lilies and things, are, you know, now are blooming where they weren't blooming there before. So this meadow was uh, completely burned. It was completely charred. Uh, but this is what happened the following spring. Everything came back and there's just these beautiful displays of flowers. This was around Lake County. It wasn't public land. This is Butts, Butts Canyon Road uh, for any of you who know where that area is. But again, this was all burned. We were in Pepperwood Preserve. Uh, this whole area was burned. I, you know, gingerly walked through and, you know, stepped mainly on where the invasive grasses were to get to these California poppies. You can see uh, how the trees were burned back there. I looked in the soil beneath me and it was all, all charred. So it's just, just amazing to see what came back after the fires had been there. And this is the Tubbs fire, which burned a lot of the buildings and killed a lot of people in, in uh, Santa Rosa. Mm -hmm. So this is a scarlet monkey flower in the Cleveland National Forest way down south. After the burn, Nita found these two flowers nestled together in the Pepperwood Preserve. So we photographed it this way. I didn't arrange the flowers at all. It was just you know, it's something Nita found. And then quickly, we're going to go through some of uh, our desert images. This is uh, Death Valley um, during one of the super blooms. You know, I love, I love the desert, and especially after the sun has set, you have this beautiful, soft twilight, this kind of a little bit of cool light. And so it puts a different uh, softness on on the scene, I was just really fascinated by these desert sunflowers that were growing right out of the rocks. This is Nada in Death Valley. This was a beautiful broom rape that was right in that area where Nita was photographing. Again, these are uh, desert sunflowers in a, in a Vol, you know, black volcanic rock in Death Valley. And this was our first experience with, a, with what was then called a hundred year bloom. Just, just, and, and then seven years later, there was a second hundred year bloom. And now they call them super blooms. This one was Death Valley in 1998, as was the previous image. We like to try to find insects on the plants. And this is a crab spider, which um, on yellow flowers can be a bright yellow spider. Uh, so the next series of images is in Joshua Tree. So a lot of, you know, the upper part of Joshua Tree has a lot of granite, therefore a lot of granitic soils. So you see this beautiful uh, granitic soil texture with these wonderful flowers growing out of it. This is a typical desert wash in the southern end of uh, Joshua Tree around, I think, Cottonwood, Cottonwood. Campground. Now, a uh, normal year, you'd see a, just a, a few Canterbury bells blooming here and there. But in 1998, uh, there was an abundance of rain. And so all these Canterbury bells were, were growing up out of this granitic soil. Um, not only were there a lot of them, but because of the, the, there was so much rain and how long it fell, these flowers grew taller and taller, so there were more blossoms. So this was a beautiful, you know, desert wash scene to photograph. This is Chia. Desert dandelion. And then you have to, when you're photographing flowers, sometimes you have to watch as to um, whether they close up at night. And this one happens to start closing up early. We wanted to photograph a different one um, in Death Valley and found it was actually closing at three o'clock in the afternoon, which was quite early. And sometimes they'll actually turn towards our reflectors. And this is Anza Borrego Desert State Park. 
during another super bloom in the southern part of the park. And we are almost there. And we were really fortunate in Anza Borrego one year we had out of 12 days we were there, we had nine days with some rain. And this is a rare, rare a very rare fog we were told there. I mean, there was, there was so much moisture around it in the soil that uh, on, a, on a day, on our previous rainy day, there was this beautiful fog in the morning. And then back to Antelope Valley, California Poppy Reserve, where it all started. And those are the San Gabriel Mountains in the background. Wow, this is some serious eye candy. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's just so beautiful out there. You know, I, it's just, 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 it, it's just hypnotic. And then it breaks our heart when people go out there and trample over it, you know, and they have to close down Lake Elsinore and they, because people aren't respecting. Now, this, uh, this is one example of a flower that we photographed out of the state, but it is, you know, this species is found in the state. So there are maybe five or six images in the book, five or six flowers in the book that were photographed in, you know, Washington, Oregon, uh, Utah, Nevada, Colorado, um, that, you know, whose species live in the state so we felt comfortable putting them in because we didn't have those flowers we never found the flowers here and so i'm just going to come go through a number of uh two page spreads we're almost at the end here and this is a uh, wall of uh, serpentine rock a lot of which is also found that was in the foothills it's also found a lot in marin county especially on mount tam Table Mountain, which is another one of our favorite areas near Chico. The uh, flower on the left is the mountain um, lady slipper. It's an orchid and we actually drove 150 miles when somebody told us it, it was there and they could show us where it was. Uh, the flower on the right is the Pasque flower that we photographed in Mount Rainier, but it lives here. So again, we use all natural light, we use reflectors, we use diffusers, we use a combination of both of them and, you know, to get the lighting effects that we want. The flower on the left is uh, the Tiburon Mariposa Lily, um, the pear, and that only grows on Ring Mountain and it's the only place in the world that that plant grows. And that was the, one of the main reasons that that whole area was protected. So it was a lot of work to put this together, but we absolutely um, loved the results. And um, one of the things we wanted to do with the book too, is since there was a lot of terminology people might not be familiar with and we wanted to be an educational book is we created a glossary and also two indices so there's a plant indice by name and then also by location so if you want to know what's on mount tamalpais you can go into the uh, location indices and take a look And again, one of the reasons we did this book, this is a great quote by David Brower. Would you like to read it? Truth and beauty can still win battles. We need more art, more passion, and more wit in defense of the earth. And, and you know, more art is what we tried to do. And the passion is obvious. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so we have the regular edition book, which you saw the cover at the beginning. And then we also have a limited edition book which comes in a special clamshell box and um, a cloth covered book, each with a photograph on the cover. And um, if you get the regular edition book, if you 
peel back and look under the desk jacket, the paper cover of the book, you will see this beautiful poppy on the uh, case wrap or the cover of the book. And Laura Lovett, uh, uh, who we mentioned before, our, our book designer came up with this beautiful uh, idea for the hard cover for the book. So we want to thank all of you who hung in there. Yeah. It took us a little longer than we expected, but um, the joy. It's our book is available at wildflowerbook.com. And if you live in the area and you want a um, signed copy or personalized copy, you can go to wildflowerbook.com and order to pick it and plan to pick it up. And we can do a safe transfer of a book to you. And we'll personalize it for you. We'll, we'll, we'll put your name down there and tell you how much we're grateful for everything you do to protect nature's beauty and California's wildflowers. You're, you're getting lots of gratitude online here, by the way. Oh, oh great. Thank you. So I'm going to take off the sharing, I think. Can I do that? I don't know that um, if you do you have a few some energy to answer a few. Oh, oh sure, absolutely. yeah. I mean, we're here. We're not going anywhere. All we're right. happy. Yeah, we love questions. Thank you. Well, there's a couple of questions that kind of go together. People have been asking about your um, uh, any reference books you might for photo editing or or wildlife photography or uh, beginning phone camera photography, and if you have any tips on the iPhone, all those sort of are in the same neck of the woods. Well, there's, there's a lot of videos out there. Um, we don't have a lot of experience using the phone. I'm, I'm so uh, uh, focused on using the camera because it gives me such great resolution, and then there's so much more I can do with a raw file. I know some, uh, some smartphones now you can have right you can choose to capture the image in a raw file format and that's a whole nother conversation what that means but um, but what I um, there are a lot of videos that you can go online and and uh, do a search for iPhone uh, photography or ha how to take photographs of flowers with your iPhone or a lot of the local libraries, at least ours in Marin, have a connection with lynda.com. And lynda.com has videos to learn everything. And you can actually, it's normally subscri a subscription, but through the libraries, you can actually go and um, watch the videos for free. And there are local camera clubs. I know uh, the Marin Photo Club probably has someone or a group of someone's who have used iPhones for you know macro photography? I know you can get macro attachments for your uh, for your smartphones, but I'm I'm sorry we we can't give you the answers we want to do because we don't have that much experience. Doing right? That. Yeah. No. No problem. I mean, I I think it's the cameras still aren't still aren't there. <laughs> the the, uh, the phone cameras anyway. Yeah, and while the phone cameras are pretty damn good now, yeah. Um, yeah. and so and the and the higher the I, the phones in in number, I mean the newer ones do better uh, macro work too. So are you using iNaturalist at all, just for identification purposes and such? We tend to use more um, wildflower well, books, books, the books, but also Cal um, Calflora. Cal and okay. Calscape, right, as two places, and then we also ask our local experts and CNPS members. We we decided it was okay for us not to be ex experts in knowing the names of flowers. We just our expertise was finding them and photographing them. We mentioned there was the California uh, mountain lady slipper that we went out to photograph up in Chico. Well, that information came from us. Quincy, I'm sorry, that information where we could find that flower came from a CNPS member. Two of them took us out to the exact location, said, this is the flower you're looking for. This is where it is. We're going to wait here till you photograph it, and then we're going to show you some other things we love. So we, we, I mean, we got so much guidance and so much help from uh, 
different chapter members up and down the state. It's an amazing community. Yeah, it really, really is. Yeah. I mean, everyone wants to help. And I'll, I'll uh, how about I end it on this question, which is uh, from Sarah. Is there a wildlife, flora, or even fauna experience you've had during your photography work that stands out as particularly moving or awe-inspiring? Well, it was that hummingbird. Uh, oh, well, there's another one. What? Uh, we were up on Mount Rainier, and there was a marmot hanging oh, out right. on a rock sunbathing. And he decided he was hungry, and he climbs down, or she, and starts um, eating the lupin and just following along, eating the lupin and just like shop vacuuming the lupin. I mean, it was really funny to watch. And a little girl um, squealed when she saw it, and it looked up and it had a mouth has a mouthful of lupin petals. And, and it, I got it. And and we got it. And it and it looks like it's saying. Flowers? What flowers? Who I'm not eating flowers. And meanwhile, has this mouthful of flowers. And that was a really fun experience. So those were the two ones. But that hummingbird was just really, really special. And one of the nice things about taking so long to take a photograph is that if we're in some place for about half an hour or an hour, do you see, you know, you hear the birds that are in the area. You, you see the insects. We were in. Uh, Joshua Tree photographing, I think it was a, um, some beautiful yellow flower, I forgot what the name of it is. We were there for, in, in that area for four hours and there, was, uh, and there was a mockingbird that was flying back and forth and serenading us for four hours. And you know, it was a mockingbird. So the, so the songs that this bird was singing, there was so much variety. It was just beautiful. At one point, we just sat down and shut our eyes and just listened to the bird. But that's what, you know, if, if you spend a lot of time in one particular place photographing a flower, you get the experience of the other life. It's insects, maybe a bird. We never saw very many other animals but just being in one place is so rewarding because you absorb that area so much more completely yeah and feel free to go to our website and if your question didn't get answered feel free to send us an email please include your phone number because if the answer is going to be more complicated we'd rather talk to you um, than spend a bunch of time writing it out but we we'd be happy to happy to help anyone well, far out, that was just absolutely wonderful. Your dedication to capturing the beauty of California is truly inspiring. Well, thank thank you. you. Thank you. And we'll look forward, hopefully one day we can all be together. Yes. 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 <laughs> thanks, thanks again. And we'll, uh, we'll look forward to seeing you hopefully again in the, fu in the near future. Yeah, and thank you, Eddie, and, and the Yerba Buena chapter for making this possible. It, it was just so exciting to be invited to do this and to have such a great audience. I mean, we looked at all the people that showed up and there are a lot of people, so thank you. Yeah, and, and uh, there's many, many, uh, much gratitude in the, uh, in the chat and the Q&A, so I'll, I'll save that for you all. Okay. Great, thank, thank you. a lot of people very Bye, happy. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye.